Okay, so it looks like we are are ready to go. Um, and uh, I'd like to kind of say hello and, and welcome everybody to our um, Facebook Live today. I'm Jamie Miller from Miller & Miller, and we're doing an exciting um, Facebook Live, and I have a wonderful guest that is joining me today, as you can see on the screen. Um, we have Christy Arkovich, um, who I am proud to announce that we at Miller Miller are partnering with to better serve our clients uh, in the area of student loan um, defense, um, trying to figure out ways whether you have a federal student loan or private student loan to aid with the dischargeability or setting up, up payment plans. But so excited that Christy is with us and Christy has a lot of experience, over 25 years of uh, practicing law. Um, she's a lawyer out of Tampa, Florida, Florida, went to Stetson Law School in Florida, graduated with honors and was on law review. So very, very impressive. Um, she's been featured on Nightline in Business Week. So she's known uh, nationally as one of the leading experts on helping people with student loans. Um, been as zealous advocates for consumer rights in the mortgage industry as well as the student loan industry. Um, author of the book, How to Take Your Life Back from Your Student Loans, and a uh, graduate, along with me, of Josh Cohn's um, Student Loan uh, Law Boot, boot Camp. Um, the other exciting thing about Christy is that she's also represented student loan companies themselves. So she was trial counsel for Sally May previously. So she knows what's going on um, on the other side of things um, from the student loan perspective um, and has also represented other, um, other servicers. Um, but excited to welcome Christy to give us some insight on how specifically today to deal with uh, student loan uh, in COVID. And this is going to be um, kind of our kickoff of a series of conversations that we're gonna have with Christy about dealing with uh, student loans as the landscape on uh, dealing with student loans changes. So um, could, could sit here all day and say wonderful things about you, Christy. Thank you uh, for joining me. And how, how's your day going today? Thank you, Jamie. Um, day has been great. We just got off um, the parkway for a moment. We are in the Shenandoah Valley right now. We're headed back to Florida. Uh, I normally practice in Tampa, Florida, but we have been on an adventure. We left Florida back the end of June when the COVID numbers were getting kind of high, humidity and COVID was sort of racing neck to neck, and uh, we headed out west. So we've been to Yellowstone, uh, Rocky National Park. We've been to um, uh, Custer State Park, just all over the place. Iowa, uh, we had a wedding in Pennsylvania, and now we're headed back to Florida. So, uh, fortunately, with a good internet connection, and, and we believe in redundancy, so we've got three different ones, uh, we've been able to do everything. So, we're driving today. Um, if we have any connection problems, it's completely my fault, and I apologize to everyone. Uh, but we are, like Jamie said, um, we're going to be starting to work together um, to help. Uh, Jamie's clients in reducing or eliminating student loan debt. It's sort of a niche, a specialty of our, of our firm. And we can work with his clients um, to try to reduce that debt and uh, both inside and outside of bankruptcy. And I look forward to and would appreciate Jamie reaching out to me and seeing if uh, what we can do together. Well, you're uh, coming in crystal clear and I, I appreciate that. And um, let's start talking. There's there's two different student types of student loans that people are dealing with. So there's federal student loans and there's private student loans. So if you could talk a little bit about student loans and COVID, um, I'd appreciate that. Okay, absolutely. Uh, the first thing we do when a client comes in to see us is we ask what kind of loans they have, private versus federal, because the abilities to deal with them are very different. And so let's take federal, for instance, at first. A lot of folks are thinking, well, I have direct federal loans, and right now they're interest-free. So a lot of the Dave Ramsey-type viewpoint is pay those loans down, pay them as much as you can now, uh, maybe even make increased principal payments, because every dollar you're paying right now during the COVID CARES Act protections is going directly to principal. Um, I take it one step further, though. 
with federal loans, we've actually been able to rehab and consolidate a lot of people who have been in default. And if we do it now during the COVID protections that has been passed by executive order and also the CARES Act back in March, we can save clients a lot of money because they don't have to make these higher payments during the time that we're curing a default. So we really like doing that. Um, but for federal loans, the best thing out there is usually an income driven plan. The thing is there's lots of different income driven plans. And when you're talking with the servicer, the servicer, it's very important that debtors and consumers realize the servicer doesn't represent them. They represent the creditor. And so they're not necessarily going to tell someone of all of their options. We see someone in the wrong income driven plan all the time. And they're in one that has a higher monthly payment. I've even some had some that are in the older plans that didn't have forgiveness. They should have switched over years ago, but they didn't know to do that. So it's super important that folks, you know, right now during COVID, even if they're not making a payment, um, just to make a plan, you know, decide when I get back to work or when things get back to normal, what can I do now that will help me reduce my debt in the future? Um, and we ran into the same thing back in the mortgage crisis. You know, when we had folks that were unemployed, you know, they thought, well, I'll go ahead and catch up on all this credit card debt I'm running up when I get a job. And then they start making $80,000. All of a sudden, they're looking at a Chapter 13 filing with having to pay back a portion of the debt. When had they acted during the crisis, it could have been a Chapter 7. And that debt could have been gone in 90 days. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, using this crisis time to eliminate that debt is very good. So with income-driven plans right now, why not use today's income to determine what your payment's going to be for the next 12 months? Why wait till January when you're all back to work? The 20% pay reduction is, I mean, I don't know about January anymore. I mean, it, it, fair, you know, in fairness, it might be next summer or so. We really don't know. But um, I take advantage of that time right now. And then there's other ways with disability that we can talk about too. Um, we have some folks that they're concerned. They're concerned about returning to work right now during COVID because um, they're either older or they have some health conditions or maybe they're staying home with someone who does have health conditions. Well, if you wanna take a break from work and make a limited income for three years because there's a monitoring period, folks that are in their 60s or so or have underlying health conditions may qualify for a total and permanent disability. I have not, I have not lost one of those applications yet. Every single one that we filed has been granted. And it's a great way to get rid of federal student loans, it takes less than three months, and they're done. But you have to limit your income for at least three years afterwards. And during COVID, maybe this is a time to take that shot. You know, so I'm all about taking advantage of the opportunities presented now to reduce the debt. So when everything's back to normal, you're back on a level playing field and you don't have this hum uh, humongous debt. So the, the CARES Act that was um, passed in March, um, there was a moratorium that was put in place that was extended till October. And now I understand that it's been extended to December. So what should somebody be doing now if there's that moratorium um, to prepare, um, you know, uh, for, for January of 2021? Well, the first thing I would do is find out what type of federal loans you have, if you have federal loans. Uh, there's two basic types. One is direct, which are owned by the government, and one is FEL, which are federal family education loans. Prior to 2010, 80% of loans were the older FEL loans. Well, they've been discontinued. The, the middleman has been eliminated, so there's no longer loans federally that are originated by Bank of America, Navient, Sally Mae, things like that. Instead, they're, they're just originated by the government, so they're owned by the government. So the FEL loans, FEL loans don't have the advantages that direct loans do. For instance, the CARES Act doesn't apply, so interest still accrues. The forbearances don't apply, but usually they'll push them anyway. Um, the public service loan forgiveness, that doesn't apply for the older FEL loans. Even the Repay Act, the 10% um, you know, discretionary income payment that you're making, that doesn't work for FEL loans. So it's very important that people now find out what kind of federal loans you have, and if they're the older FEL loans, convert them to uh, the newer direct loans. Also, the HEROES Act, the stimulus that they're talking about now, if they pass a 10,000 or 30,000 or some kind of principal you know, forgiveness of some sort, that's only gonna apply to direct loans. And there's a reason for that. The government cannot reduce a loan that's actually owned by someone else. That would be you know, due process, contract violations, and things like that. They can only reduce what they themselves own. And so the, don't, the loans that are directly owned by the government, the direct loans, are in a better position for relief. So I would switch all the loans. And how you switch them is do a consolidation. 
but there's concerns with consolidation. We don't recommend it across the board for everyone. And that's why it's important to talk with someone who's knowledgeable like myself, because number one, you never want to put a parent plus loan with your own loans. It screws everything up. I won't say why, but it, it messes things up. Second, you um, don't necessarily want to consolidate, create a new loan if you've already been in an income driven plan for a number of years because you lose those years. Now, it may not work to your disadvantage, but it, it could hurt. So we want to check that. Um, there's just a number of things uh, that we want to check. Sure. Consolidation will also capitalize the interest. So if they've been in an interest-driven plan for a long time, maybe we don't want that interest capitalized. But if someone's right. not even been in a plan, they've been in forbearance, then by all means, change the direct now I can. Yeah, and I, I get a lot of clients that come in and say, I've been, you know, I talked to my servicer. They've been really nice to deal with. They told me to go into a, you know, an income-driven plan. And what... What should a client do? Are they do they need a lawyer to to help them get into these repayment plans, or what do you think about having them do it on their own? I have a perfect story for this. We had a client um, that came to us that was in her low sixties, like sixty one, sixty two. She was wanting to retire. She worked part time for her husband's business, but she was afraid that she couldn't because her daughter had went to a I think it was a New York ballet school, and there's a huge Parent Plus loan out there. And this client was paying $1,400 a month. So she came to me. She had a servicer that was very kind to her on the phone. She could get them on the phone immediately. The wait time was awesome. She could get her questions answered. And they told her that there was nothing they could do. They also had a big blue banner across their website. And the banner said, don't pay for help. We're here for you. We'll explain our options and so forth. So she came to Florida. She was visiting a relative. The relative happened to be another client of mine. She insisted that she come in to see me. She didn't want to, but she finally did. Within five minutes, we had determined that her payment could drop to zero if she just did three things. She needed to change her loan type, apply for ICR, which is a certain payment program for Parent PLUS loans, and file a separate tax return from her husband, which didn't take any anything away from her, although in some cases it does, so we want to we wanna watch that as to what tax hit would be for filing separately. But her payment went from 1400 to zero. So I blogged about it, and my blog was basically, what was the cost of... Uh, that free help. Well, it was $1,400 a month for however long she did it until she reached out for someone who represented her. Because again, the servicer represents the other side. So they might be telling the truth. There are good customer representatives for some servicers. But if you call six different times, you're going to get four or five different answers. How is a person to determine which one's right? One of them's probably right, but which one is it? And so um, the free help out there, it, you got to take it with the cautionary tale. And it's important to educate yourself as to the differences between the income driven plans and not just go on a random one that the servicer may suggest. A lot of folks are on older plans that should be converted to newer plans. And it's not being discussed with them that, hey, you're on an older one. There's a better one that fits your circumstances. You really need to you know, flip over to that one. You don't lose credit. You don't lose the years that you've accumulated on the old one as long as you're dealing with the same loan. Yeah, and so just so people understand. Yeah, it does. If someone gets on an income-based repayment plan and they continue to keep it updated, what, what eventually happens to those student loans um, yes. as long as they continue to stay on that plan? That's another thing. Um, surprisingly, we've had a lot of clients come to us that are on an income-driven plan, but then they don't know what happens at the end. Well, the end is the goal. It's for forgiveness, basically. So let's say someone owes $150,000. And over the course of 20 years, under a 10% repay program, they pay 80,000 of it. You know, so they still owe 70. That 70,000 is completely written off at the end of 20 years. Now, it's supposed to be taxed, all right, unless they're public service, in which case the loan is gone in 10 years. So that's the advantage of public service. You're still making a payment, but you have a non-taxable event at the end, and the time period from 20 to 25 is now only 10 years. Another thing, someone might be in their 70s at the end of 20 or 25 years. Well, we put them in a total and permanent disability discharge application. That currently is tax-free, happens in three months, and they're done. So we have a different exit strategy for people who are older. They might be in the income-driven plan for a little while, but then they'll go out on a TPD discharge after a while. Um, and so and, that and forgiveness is real, basically. That's what we're looking for. And what happens to somebody's credit if they go into one of these income-based repayment plans? Doesn't hurt it a bit. Doesn't hurt a bit. In fact, Fannie and FHA have new programs that allow for mortgage underwriters to look at the income-driven payment. So you might see a 10-year standard be $1,200. 
but you might see someone making say 30 and 40,000, their payment might be two or 250. Well, the mortgage underwriter is allowed to use the 200, the 250 payment and their, in, their um, credit score is not hurt at all by being in an income plan. Okay. There's also no um, competition. Of and then, um, so if someone has a question about um, their federal student loans or their private student loans, they can contact um, Miller Miller at 414-875-3816 or go to our website, millermillerlaw.com, and we'll be happy to set up a consult um, for you. And then, um, Christy, I wanna switch and talk about private loans and what what's happening in the, the the world of bankruptcy and private student loans? And maybe you can kind of shed some light on that because there's some really exciting things that's happening in that area. Yes, um, there's a mantra around a lot of bankruptcy attorneys where they all tell their clients that you can't discharge student loans. And that's been the accepted norm for years. And it still is for the most part true for federal loans, but with private loans, we have been able to discharge them in bankruptcy very easily. Um, it's called an adversary process. We either reopen an old bankruptcy, you know, maybe someone filed in the foreclosure crisis a bankruptcy back in 2008, 2010, we reopen it. We actually love to reopen because then we have a stick that we can use along with our carrot. The stick is, well, hey, the, the, you know, the creditor, they didn't come to the underlying bankruptcy and you know, file their own adversary. So any collection efforts they've taken if we win, every single phone call, every single letter, every single thing they've done to try to collect that debt in that last five, six intervening years is technically a violation of the law. So that's the stick. Hey, if we win, the other side gets hit big. And our carrot is maybe we'll offer them a little bit, you know, pennies on the dollar and no interest going forward or maybe 1%, something really small. We have get, I mean, this, this past week, we had two discharges. One was a uh, tuition and loan, which was money that was lent to our student beyond the cost of education. The other was a bar study loan. Both loans are completely discharged. The other side agreed you know, really within a month, and we had those cases resolved. So um, we love filing bankruptcies with private student loans, whether they're new bankruptcies or old bankruptcies. But again, it only works with private loans. Federal loans, the standard is very tough still. It's going to take an act of Congress to change that or maybe um, some kind of circuit court decision that gets bumped up to the U.S. Supreme Court, something that changes the old standard called In Ray Bruner. But for private loans, this is working now. I'd highly recommend it to everybody. So how does someone know whether they have a private or a federal student loan? Well, one um, characteristic is when you look at the list of loans that um, Navient or you know, Great Lakes or whoever might have on their statement, at the bottom, it usually will say SIG or signature. That's a sign that it's a private loan. If it says things like direct, a bunch of initials or acronyms like FEL or you know, Federal Family Education Loan, um, Stafford, um, basically uh, uh, non-Stafford, you know, any, anything like that, um, subsidized, unsubsidized, those are terms that are used for federal loans. Um, SIG or signature for private loans. There is a more official way, and that is the National Student Loan Database Report. That's nslds.org, I think is what the address is. Um, someone can pull a report. Anything on there is a federal loan. It doesn't report all federal loans, but most are on there. For instance, a joint spousal consolidation where husband and wife combine their loans. For some reason, the report only shows them on one of the borrowers instead of both, even though it's technically both loans. Um, medical loans are covered under the HEAL Act, and MOHILA usually doesn't report on that. So it has most federal loans, but guaranteed anything on that list is definitely not private, and there is no private database. The only way you find out about private loans is answer the phone, maybe check a credit report, mail, you know, something like that to see what's out there on private loans. And private loans also have statute of limitations. They have documentary issues. Those loans would have been placed in trust. Sometimes that wasn't done. Uh, maybe some documents may have been lost or misplaced. They have calculation issues. Uh, we look for errors, we look for statute of limitations. We look for loans that are with ineligible institutions, um, beyond the cost of attendance, all those kinds of things, um, institutions that aren't open for two years, maybe Caribbean medical schools. Most of those aren't eligible for federal funds. There's lots and lots of reasons why a private student loan could be dischargeable. 
Yeah, and what, what what's really exciting about this is when you talk about private student loans and dischargeability, you know, if you filed bankruptcy three years ago or 10 years ago, and you have private student loans that are still lingering out there that they may in, be in default or you're trying to make payments, um, there's still something that we can do about it now. Um, I just had a client that you and I have been working on together that filed a bankruptcy in 2017, and she had over 350 or has over $350,000 in student loan debt. And frankly, back in 2017, there wasn't much litigation going on with the dischargeability and things have really changed. And so I found her in our database. I picked up the phone and called her and she is uh, just so thrilled um, that we're taking a second look at this. And um, so message out to anybody, if you have private student loans, you filed bankruptcy in the past, um, you know, please reach out. Um, you can reach us at 414-875-3816 um, or at millermillerlaw.com. And Christy and I are going to um, partner together um, to help you build your new future and really um, just give you some great insight on how to deal with student loans. And Christy, I, I'm just so grateful um, that you were able to join us today. Um, I hope you have continued safe travels back to, to Tampa. And um, like I said previously, this is a series of um, our first of uh, four topics that we're going to cover on, on student loans in the next couple of weeks. So I would urge you to um, to, to join us and we'll get those announced out on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, YouTube. And uh, so you can follow us, but Chrissy, thank you so much. And I will look forward to talking to you soon. And if anybody wants some additional materials on our website, we have an ebook that I wrote called how to take your life back from your student loans. Uh, there's also a recent webinar course. The most recent thing I did uh, about a week ago uh, that was put on by the CPA Academy on um, the same topic on how to help clients basically get rid of student loans. And uh, so there's a lot of materials on my website. So my website is christiearkovich.com and that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E and last name is A-R-K-O-V-I-C-H.com. And so you're welcome to go on there, take a look, uh, see what you think. If you do contact our office uh, by email or text or phone, be sure to mention uh, Jamie Miller's office. Um, we are working in these cases together and we wanna make sure to give him proper credit and work on these cases together. So thank you very much for all your time. Hope this has been helpful and I look forward to doing a series on some additional things next few weeks. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.